Wow, we've all been there, haven't we? Casually browsing the internet, maybe looking for some guitar gear advice. Perhaps you've dragged out a 20-year-old amp modeler from the closet and you're looking for some tech specs or some how-tos, and then you stumble across it, that metaphorical train wreck of a forum post. And just like a real train wreck, you can't take your eyes off of it. One side's calling the other side a bunch of idiots, and this side's calling that side contrarians for the sake of being contrarian. And then you realize the arguments about a little black box the size of the palm of your hand. And that's precisely what we're talking about today on this introductory episode of a series I'm calling Down the Rabbit Hole. We'll be definitely visiting Wonderland on a couple of these installments. And today's first topic is the Harmonic Converger. Now, I wanted to make this series of videos because there's lessons to be learned here. I'm not one for drama. It does not interest me whatsoever. I'm not turning into Keemstar. Don't worry about that. The main reason I want to talk about some of these products, some of these um, controversies, is because it often shines a good light on things to learn when it comes to music production, as well as other things that pertain to general consumption that you should watch out for when you're paying for any good and today's topic hits on all those points. But before diving into this little black box specifically, I kind of have to give you a primer on why this emerged. So in the early era of guitar amp modeling, you had products like the Pod or the Boss GT series or the Korg, Zooms, you name it. One of the dirty words that popped up around those products was fizz. Now, as you might imagine, many players were and continue to be pretty stoked about the concept of packing 1632, nowadays hundreds of amp models, in a desktop unit or a floorboard unit or even a rack unit that allow them to replace an entire amplifier half stack and maybe even a pedal collection where you don't necessarily have to emulate different amps with different stomp boxes or overdrives or preamp pedals. You can just pull up the amp model and be done. And of course, there was the price factor as well as a lot of these units were coming in, you know, maybe half, even a third the price of what an amplifier head alone would cost. So pretty enticing. But a lot of people found with these earlier models that they just didn't really sound all that much like a real amplifier. Besides some of the obvious complaints with models not really sounding all that much like the amp or cab they're trying to emulate, one of the biggest complaints surrounding amp modelers was the digital fizz. And it was actually kind of a bigger problem I found in amp modelers that came later. So say the 2003 to 2007 timeframe when you had the XT, X3, and of course all of the other competitors from other companies. As a result, fizz became kind of this four letter word for the guitar community. And in response, people from all over the world were showing their ways to try to combat the fizz problem, whether it be uh, pairing it with a digital graphic EQ or putting it through different speakers, all that sort of stuff. And one such gentleman that was equally disappointed in this fizz problem was a guitarist by the name of Hadley Hawkinsmith. Now Hadley's a professional musician having played with Neil Diamond for quite some time by the mid 2000s and also a self-proclaimed electronics tinkerer. So he comes around and says, look guys, I'm equally as disappointed in this kind of stuff too. I can never get that sweet spot sound out of these digital modelers. So I came up with a product just for that and it's called the Rad, <laughs> I can't even say that with a straight face, the Rad Tone <laughs> Harmonic Converger. And this was that little aforementioned black box I was telling you about. Well, there was a number of SKUs for different amp modelers, whether you were running a Boss GT or a Line 6 Pod, and even different revisions of those individual SKUs over the years that this was sold as things were tweaked and uh, optimized for each modeler. But essentially, what this thing's advertised doing is you either buy a loop model for products that have that, um, either being mono or stereo, or a mono or stereo output, or even one for headphones, that cleans up that fizz and adds, as they describe it, natural and organic harmonic sounds that you would only associate with a tube amp. And this was also advertised as being completely passive circuitry, which means no battery required, no power supply. And many of these units included a drive pot to tweak it to your liking for whatever amp model you're using. So all this is sounding not bad. You're like, yeah, okay. Um, get a little bit more authentic tube tone out of the amp modeler. 
cool. Let's go over, see maybe we'll buy one. Uh, what you get with this, okay. Um, number one, experience. <laughs> okay, fair enough. Um, seasoned ears. All right, it takes the taste of balance, both musicality and electronic smart to design and produce a harmonic converger. Fair enough, I suppose. Time, HCs are quite time consuming to build, intense and unforgiving work, extensive tests and ear tweaking are done uh, because there's a plus minus tolerance on all the components. Welcome to electronics in general. It's really not something to brag about. Um, you bend parts, that's just part of the job. <laughs> Uh, specialized custom built components, point to point hand wiring. That's pretty cool. So, you know, no uh, PCBs here and they're pretty much, you know, completely done by hand, which is nice. Okay, all right, I'm kind of on board. Let's scroll down. Holy shit, $275 for that. Are you kidding me? Um, let's put this in perspective too. So this was $275 when this website was last updated in 2007. And it said that they've not gone up in over four years, which is cool, I guess. Uh, that is approximately $340 in 2019 dollars. So, you know, you're looking at a, a sizable chunk of money for something that big back then. Now, make no mistake, I'm an owner of one or two seemingly overpriced stop boxes myself. The thing with these, though, is at the very least, the manufacturer intends for you to pair these with high gain amp heads that are anywhere from four times as much in cost. So that's on the low end up to what, 25 times as much, depending on what you buy. So if you're rocking a diesel VH4, you're probably not gonna sweat too much about you know paying a couple hundred bucks for a stomp box. It's all about context. However, with the harmonic converger, we're talking about pairing it with a, a product that you know at most was going new for what, 500 bucks for the Boss GT and the Pod XT, um, maybe even cheaper if you're willing to settle for a B stock product. So for over half the cost of something that includes amps and effects and drive pedals and all this stuff, you're getting a, you know, something that's no hardly bigger than a camera battery with some passive circuitry in it. So for that money, I mean, it better be a roadie. It better do the dishes for me for 275 bucks. The question is, for those that, you know, were willing to gamble on it, did it work? And if it worked, how did it work? According to many user reviews, it did what it said it was gonna do, it imparted um, some of those nicer sounding frequencies and, and killed the fizz. The problem came when people tried to figure out what it did because like many of these proprietary circuits, the, you know, the, the circuit board was completely gunked in you know, black tar. So uh, no real way of reverse engineering it and, and seeing it exactly what was under the hood. I don't particularly have a problem with that. You're trying to protect your product. I get it. However, it didn't take the audio enthusiasts and those with circuit knowledge too long to piece the puzzle together. And now today you can find schematics that will pretty much do what the harmonic converger does that you can build yourself. Before we get into that though, let's have a listen to what the harmonic converger does so you can decide for yourself if you think this was a cool effect or not. So we'll have a listen to three different amp modelers. We'll use the Pod 2.0 to represent kind of the older gen tech at the time, we'll use the Pod X3 since this shares the same algorithms with the XT and has some of those fizzy qualities that they're trying to capture or eliminate in this instance. And I'll also demo the Zoom G2, which I've apparently misplaced or moved out of this room before filming. Awesome. So with that, let's have a listen to all those processors, a couple different tone variations with the harmonic converger on and off.
you tell a difference? And if you could, do you think that was an improvement or just kind of a wash, just different for the sake of being different? Better yet, how did I do that? Because I don't own a harmonic converter, don't have one borrowed or anything like that. Well, I'll tell you how. It's a really simple trick. In fact, any nine-year-old that can operate Audacity can do this trick. And this is basically what the harmonic converter looks like. Uh, if that doesn't take some wind out of your sails, I don't know what will. So I can't tell you how many RCL or RC circuit problems that I and every other engineering major had to solve uh, that looked sort of like this response. It's the bread and butter of an underdamped second order low pass filter. It, what do I mean by that? Well, it's a, it's a really technical jargon mumbo jumbo for this. Um, so the low pass part, a lot of you will probably be familiar with, like you're a guitar player, is to chop off the high frequency content past a certain point. So a lot of the times that's gonna be anywhere from like 7,000 Hertz to 10,000 Hertz for most guitar sounds. And that will eliminate some of that natural fizz you get even with the tube amp. Um, so the underdamped part here is this little curve. So the Q factor is such that you get a rise in the response before it falls off. In this case, there's a peak uh, around 3000 Hertz. This one's uh, showing 2780 here. And then the second order part is how quickly this falls. And actually this couldn't happen on a first order anyway. Um, but if you measure in octaves, say from 10K to 5K, you'll see that there's a, about a 12 decibel difference there. So it's roughly, like I said, a second order filter who's underdamped. Now I extracted this EQ curve from some samples that I found online that had the converger both on and off and measured the difference. But you don't have to take my word for it. Even Fractal Audio boss man Cliff Chase on an old forum confirmed that this is what this thing does. There's only so much you can do with passive circuitry. You're boosting or cutting frequencies more or less. Um, you know, if you're not throwing in op amps and, and clipping portions, then you're not really changing anything except, you know, how reduced or how focused certain aspects of the frequency spectrum are. So that's why I didn't take too long for the cat to come out of the bag when it comes to the harmonic converger. And it's why you can find all sorts of circuits that do, if not the identical thing, something extremely close. This piece of information really added fuel to the fire to the harmonic converger controversy because people started thinking, well, why can't I just buy an EQ pedal or especially a 31 band rack unit that I can tweak and, and make this curve myself? And there will be differences when we're talking about passive circuitry. There's things like impedance interactions that will change this curve and it will change from modeler to modeler. But I think uh, the larger point that a lot of people had that I tend to agree with is why can't you just tune it for yourself? Uh, why do I have to rely on someone else doing it for me? Now, the HC topic continued to come up from time to time, but it was really on its deathbed around this time period with the release of the AxeFX standard and later the AxeFX Ultra which Hadley himself actually defected over to and admitted that he didn't use any other outboard gear with it because it sounds pretty much like a real lamp and all the, the qualities it models are the ones that you want. Now, especially by the time the Pod HD series launched, even though there was an HD 500 compatible device, most users were saying, yeah, it doesn't really add much. Their power amp modeling, everything is, you know, it has its drawbacks, as I previously discussed in a uh, review on it, but it doesn't really benefit from this. Uh, it doesn't have the fizz problem that it, it did before in earlier generations. It's just not completely accurate sounding. And so with that, the harmonic converger pretty much died. So there's a few takeaways from this debacle. Uh, let me say, first of all, that I don't care what anyone sells. You have a right to it, as far as I'm concerned. If you want to, sell a quarter inch pass-through jack and write fuck you give me your money on it and someone wants to buy that for 275 dollars you're free to do so actually round of applause for selling that that's impressive um so if you don't like it you don't have to buy it that's completely fine what i take issue with is the marketing bullshit the uh buzzwords all the things that, that you know try to get you to buy something that really isn't all that novel and this example is drenched in that seeing all these words like natural harmonic tube sounds and organic and, um, you know, does it really do that? You know, if people are happy with it, cool. But we've really been to the edge of the earth and back when it comes to guitar circuits 
because there's really only so much you can do. I mean, when we're talking about amplifiers and boost pedals and all these things, it's child's play compared to even most transistor radios. There's a big difference in designing a circuit and being able to build it. And that's why I have no problem with being able to sell something like that. That's why I prefer to use a physical pedal, a high quality built pedal for things that I could otherwise do with a digital EQ in Cubase. But if you're going to do something like that, you have to be open to criticism. You have to be able to take people saying, well, what's the point? Uh, why do that when I could go for an alternative that is far cheaper and far more adaptable? Again, I'm not here to downplay the work that Mr. Hawkinsmith obviously went through to bring this thing to life. It's, you know, one part R&D. I'm sure it took a, a while to figure out that this curve was the one that sounded best. Uh, you know, it's hard enough to EQ good sounding guitar sources, let alone try to fix someone else's crap. So I respect that. I mean, that's a whole other thing to you know, put that in a functional circuit, which I personally suck at. So, uh, you know, mad respect for that, being able to uh, manually make these circuits in a point-to-point -point assembly fashion and then make them sturdy, strong enough for commercial use. That's really great and uh, definitely uh, respect worthy as well. But at the end of the day, you have to step back and, and see what this product is doing. And when it's a filter that ultimately... Uh, a smart 10 to 12 year old could do in a science fair, then is it really worth going on about for a couple web pages? I mean, I don't even think the Axe 3 has that much description on its marketing material and you could do what this does in a PEQ block. My other major problem with this product is this notion that all it takes for an amp modeler of this generation to sound more like a tube amp is some post EQ and that's just horribly inaccurate. Obviously, he recognized some of this, having different models for um, each individual amp modeler out there. But at the same time, you know, I, I can put post EQ on anything and make it sound different. Taming the fizz or adding some bump to 3K, it doesn't magically make it sound like a tube amp. There are far more, much more uh, low level differences with stuff like the Pod XT or its competitors at the time that, that far bigger issues in my opinion, whether we're talking about microphone cab modeling or the issues with the uh, lack of power amp scaling or just the fundamental tube models they have. I mean, there's even uh, aspects of like the memory that some preamp tubes build up in Axe FX modeling that you don't get in pretty much anywhere else. And so to say that, oh, well, all, all you gotta do is throw some EQ on it. Like, yeah, no, not really. And furthermore, this demonization of fizz, I, I get because that's generally the thing you hear the, the most on these amp modelers, but with stuff like the Pod 2.0 and earlier, there's actually a lack of fizz. In fact, I find myself dialing up the highs on these things if I'm recording it or, or putting it, um, you know, for a demo purpose because everything is so chopped off past like 7,000 hertz. And so it's not just a blanket statement. Even with a real tube amp and cabinet, shove an SM57 up to the cone and what do you get? Fizz. It happens in the real thing. Obviously too much of it is a bad thing, just like too much bass can be a bad thing. Um, but you do need a certain amount of it for an inspiring or especially a usable mix-ready guitar tone and so I think this notion of just, I'll oh, kill the fizz, that's, that's, the, that's the terrorist among the, uh, the amp modeling world. It, it's just not correct. You hear all these other products I was talking about, even like the Pod HD, there's ample amount of, of high frequency content there, um, but it, it does so in a way that you can kind of attack some of those nasty frequencies while letting all the, the other content stay there and, and sound good and actually contribute to a powerful mix in a meaningful way. So do I think the harmonic converger was a bad concept or a bad product? No, no, not at all. I think it missed the mark on value for a lot of people. If, you know, a Line 6 or a Boss or even a Korg was able to sell one of these things mass manufactured for, you know, 100 bucks, I could probably see it being, being fairly popular. But if I were doing this little YouTube gig thing back, you know, 12 years ago, when these were still coming out, I mean, that was even possible on YouTube because it wasn't, um, I would definitely recommend to go another route that was more adaptable to whatever you're using, something that you could tweak if you aren't necessarily a fan of it. So um, I, I guess the biggest takeaway from this is be very skeptical of everything. 
If someone is trying to sell you something, understand what it does, why it does that thing, and how it compares to the competition. And sometimes, I mean, there's just a black box over it and you, you can't really understand completely unless you actually buy it and try it yourself, which sucks. But in this online age, it's, it's getting better about that. And whether it be one of my videos or anyone else's videos, especially if it's coming from a manufacturer, they're trying to sell you something or trying to you know, tell you this is worth buying, peer review, be skeptical, and you know, don't just throw money at the screen would, would be my, uh, my recommendation because, I mean, look how little time it took for something like this to be completely irrelevant in the ant modeling world. And I'm sure there's stuff right now that will be the same thing, but hindsight's a bitch, ain't it? So that will be all for today's Down the Rabbit Hole. I've got a couple more pretty interesting topics that uh, I'm looking forward to come up with. If you have any suggestions, please leave them down below. Any questions, comments, as always, I'll take those as well. We'll see you next time. Bye.